Welcome everybody. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Every week we work to bring you stories of people who are making a difference in the lives of others in all sorts of ways. We have a special interest in innovation, education, and entrepreneurship. And as Rotary is focused on service above self, we want to see how these things are, are out there and making a difference such that we can see possibilities that we might not have seen before. So often with Rotary, uh, people have these ideas about, oh, okay, so people around eating chicken, yes, and, and but there are all sorts of ways we can work together to, to figure out how changing pieces of our society can allow us to reach people we haven't reached before, give them hope for futures that they may not have imagined. And along those lines, we have a wonderful speaker this week. Sean Ness from the Institute for the Future is, is a gentleman who has had a lot of experience uh, with looking at possibilities for the future. He's had some experience with Rotary as well, uh, as well as uh, quite a bit of it more experience than most people I know in, uh, in polymers. So with that, I think I'll hand it over to Sean to get us started and we'll, we'll discuss our way through today's program. Thank you, Sean. Perfect. Hey, hey thanks Rushton for the wonderful glowing uh, introduction. And uh, just to highlight, yeah, I was uh, between my junior and senior year in high school, I, I received a Rotary Youth Leadership Scholarship. Uh, or sorry, award. I got a chance to spend a, a week at Slippery Rock University in Western Pennsylvania with a number of other rising seniors uh, to, to learn about leadership in, in high school. And then that followed a year later with a $500 scholarship that I used to my first year in college. So fantastic uh, experiences with Rotary in my youth, and uh, I'm glad to keep, keep the con uh, connection going now. Um, I've been at Institute for the Future for, uh, I'm now on my 16th year, so I can I can say that I, I have experienced a lot of foresight and futures. Uh, my role is in business development, so I get to work with a lot of outside organizations who want to start to build foresight capacity within their organizations, bring in futures research, but also try to reorient their organization towards what's coming next, as opposed to just focusing on uh, being reactive to the, to the near term. So happy to have this conversation with all of you. Excellent. And, and you mentioned the term foresight a couple of times. As I see it looking over the material at the Institute for the, for the Future website, there, there is this kind of basic uh, point of departure framework, you know, foresight to insight to action. Can, can you explain that as, as, a, as a grounding principle in what the organization does? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I, just before that, though, I want get, to get one thing covered, because um, usually on the tip of everyone's question is, is uh, uh, the word prediction. And the, the first thing they want to know, uh, because we've been around for 51 years, is how accurate are your predictions? And so I want to cover that right away because it's always the first question. So first off, no one can make predictions. It's impossible to predict the future. Uh, we came to that realization at the Institute probably around 1975. But that's okay. It, uh, not being able to predict the future is okay because there's utility in forecasting possible, plausible, and probable forecasts. If you can imagine a future that's different, you can start to ask that future questions. Uh, what's the best thing that could happen? What's the worst thing that could happen? Who should we partner with? Uh, what kind of technology should we invest in? What kind of uh, training do we need from our existing staff? Or if we're hiring new staff, what do they need to know how to do? Um, what laws or regulations need to be changed in the future? And, and probably a very critical one, does our current leadership have the courage or the capacity to lead us to this future? And if you can identify a desirable or preferred future, you have the holy grail as a leader. A leader then can explain to stakeholders, this is where we're going, this is how we're going to do it, and can you, can you join me in the pursuit of this future? So it's, it's a wonderful uh, thing for leaders to have. Now, to get there, you, you need some things. So the first one is provocation and understanding that things can be different. So one of our researchers has a phrase, uh, uh, before you can invent anything new, first you have to imagine that things can be different. And in the future, everything is different. Um, uh, uh, so we, we spend a lot of time provoking, using stories. Uh, another side note, the future hasn't happened yet, so there's no facts about the future. The future is all stories. It's all fiction. So foresight professionals need to be good storytellers. They need to provoke you. They need to get to you to have a visceral emotion about, uh, about things so that you have a conversation, you have a dialogue. People start to talk about uh, the, the yin and yang, the best, uh, the worst, the pros and the cons, and really work through um, why we should be talking about these futures. And 
once you provoke somebody, the, the, the real nice thing is to get them to come up with an insight. We want to provoke you so that you come up with an insight. We don't want to tell you what your insight should be. These should be things that you see, aha, this is what, what it means for me or my team, my department, my industry. Uh, and once one has identified a number of insights, so provocation, come up with insights, gather those insights together so that you can identify that preferred or desirable future that I, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then once you have that preferred future, take action. Uh, what do you need to do to achieve this future? What is our path forward? You can do back casting or you can do forecasting. Either, either way works, but put forward a plan to achieve that future so that you're creating and making the future that you want. You have agency in creating the future. And if you go through this foresight inside action process, you're gonna to start to see how that is possible, who you need to involve, and how, how you need to execute. Now, with that said, you need to be flexible because what you've decided is preferred may not be preferred by other people, organizations, and you are also at the mercy of things that you cannot control. For example, uh, the entire car industry can't control a trade dispute between America and China. Uh, so this past year, steel tariffs rose by something like 20%, which had an impact on the cost of production of vehicles, which has impacted the sale of vehicles. So we are in a decline in auto sales right now, um, which is not a desirable future for the automakers. Um, so they need a backup plan. And so when you go through this foresight inside action plan, we're not asking you to identify one preferred future. We're also asking you to consider second and third potential futures just in case you need to pivot or adjust or move to some other, uh, a little less desired future. So that when, when you start to see the signals or, 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 or the, the winds change where your preferred future is not viable, that you're prepared to pivot um, and, and you're not starting fresh. You've already experienced this future. We talked about this a year ago. If this happened, uh, we would have to make a decision to look at uh, possibility B. And if the second thing happened, we definitely had to pivot to possibility B. Uh, so we, we, we strongly suggest you be flexible in your pursuit of the future. Don't be rigid and just work on one future. Be open to that shifting uh, preferred future over time. So the old analogy would be build uh, railroad tracks to your destination because it's incredibly efficient. Now, once you build railroad tracks to your destination, you can get a lot of things accomplished. But if your destination changes, that was an expensive mistake. Uh, so go with a sailing analogy and, and be prepared to sail to any port in the future depending on where the winds head. But you know which, when you leave port, you know which port you're headed for but be prepared to go to a different port. So foresight, inside action, provoke, come up with ideas, execute on those ideas, but be flexible in the pursuit of that future. As you initially began to describe that, um, you know, I began to think, well, how's this different than a mission statement? You know, just, just something that, that allows people to stop and say, this, this is what we're about. And then as you describe it further, I think, okay, well, uh, you know, there, there's an element of, of, of the Boy Scouts, be prepared, be prepared for possibilities related to your, to your mission. And, and also something I talk about quite a bit in my own work, which is how do you build a, an ex, a culture of exploration, right? Uh, is, is in bringing those three ideas together, I mean, are, are, are you in kind of the same space as what the Institute for the Future feels uh, is, is, a, is a good framework for the businesses and organizations that it works with and trying to help them move forward? So um, I, I want to say something that might sound at first a little cynical about mission statements, but my experience with mission statements boils down to most of them are about money. How can we increase shareholder value? Um, pretty much all of them are a, a flavor of that. How do we increase shareholder value? Okay. That's, that's, the, that's the reality of mission statements. As an educator, I find that it, it, it is actually, you know, much more, much more kind of this grand thing that is so grand that people are like, yeah, 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 that could be for any school, right? So, yep. so it, it doesn't inspire action. Yeah, it's very amorphous. It's nebulous. Um, yeah, and, and, and if you were to list uh, uh, the top 50 organizations and their mission statements, uh, I, I bet very few people would be able to identify the five companies associated with it. I, I, I bet you're, you're very true. But you'd, you'd see a strong grouping around most of those mission statements around making money for shareholders. Um, and, and, and that's great. That's great. But the reality is, is uh, the future isn't always about growth. We can't just grow forever. 
you, 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 you see uh, business go through cycles, you see new organizations arise like Phoenix from, from the ashes of, of decline. Um, and organizations that have been around for a long time go through business model changes. Uh, Nokia did not start off making telco equipment, they started off making rubber hoses. And so they evolved. Uh, Nintendo uh, didn't start off making Pokemon and gaming uh, consoles. They, I don't know what they started with. They're, they're a 150 year old organization. So uh, our, our mission, the organization's values probably change over time. And so, so does societal sentiment. So mission statements are great. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. But the, I would say when it comes to organizations, the type of organizations that we tend to work with are those who have kind of plateaued. They've reached some level of saturation. And what I mean by saturation could be like, uh, I work in downtown Palo Alto, we have something like eight or 10 coffee shops in downtown Palo Alto, that's saturated. Uh, if we have another two or three come in, not sure they're all gonna survive. Um, we definitely can't double or triple the number of, 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 of coffee uh, retail outlets in, in Palo Alto. And, and most industries have saturated. If you look at the big ones like diapers and soda, and beer and insurance and banking, et cetera. They've all kind of plateaued as an aggregate. The size of the pie of those organizations isn't really gonna grow from year to year much. Um, and, and, and the players within those spheres tend to be four to six companies that control 80 to 90% of the business. And what they're mostly doing is focusing on brand and advertising. They're spending a lot of money on churn to make sure that they're stealing a little bit from this slice of the pie to give to their little pie. And the major, uh, this is unfortunate, the biggest innovations that are happening in those big pies is mergers. And, and that's the big payoff for the executives. We, we have a, uh, the second biggest one acquiring the fourth biggest one and boom, there's a merger. Um, the latest news I heard this, this past week is uh, Sprint and T-Mobile. No, not Sprint and T-Mobile. Someone's buying HP or thinking about buying HP, uh, another printer oh, yes. company. Um, uh, Japanese, Japanese printer company. Um, yes. not, was it, yeah, is it Canon? Somebody, somebody is buying or thinking of buying the printing business of HP. Xerox. Xerox, Xerox. Yeah, not, 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 not Japanese. So Xerox is considering buying HP. That's innovation, wow. Um, no, it's, I, don't, I don't consider that innovation. But, but it, it's a big payoff for the executives because one executive is going to get a, a golden parachute and the other executive is going to get a five-year deal to be the CEO. And, and everyone's going to have a great job after the fact, right? No, there will be redundancies and people will be laid off. It's not a, it's not a pleasant thing when we have mergers and acquisitions. So that, that world of incumbency of this plateau Usually those organizations are focused now on maintaining a business. They used to be focused on scale when they were just starting off. So scale is different than maintaining. Scale has different business models, different expectations. Maintenance is, is completely different. It's run by people that look like you and I. I don't know how you are old you are, Rushton. I'm 49 years old. Uh, the things I care about are my, my kids, uh, being able to pay my mortgage and save for my retirement. Um, I've, I've, I've I've kind of plateaued myself. I'm very comfortable. <laughs> yeah. um, and I want to work my 40 to 50 hours a week and then have my weekends for my, myself and my family. I don't want to sleep under my desk and ignore my significant other, my dog, and my, my plants. Um, so you have a different mindset in established organizations than you do with scale organizations. But all these big established companies are fearful of what's next. What's going to happen next? Because uh, what's next could disrupt them. Uh, what's next could be is confusing because it's different, um, but they want to be prepared. They don't want to be left behind. They don't want to be obviated like some organizations have in the past. And so we have to be prepared for what's next. But when you prepare for what's next, it's, it's, it's difficult because you don't know when to jump. If you jump too early, you're going to maybe choose poorly. If you jump too late, you're too late. Um, and then it, it's a matter of focus. Who, how do we decide how to, how to make this decision. Um, and a lot of that barrels down to um, human resources. But before I get to that, when, when I talk about jumping to what's next, we look at the world from a perspective of changes in society, shift changes. We're going from the old way to the new way. Uh, so a current old way, new way would be this, what we're working on right now would be laptops. That's the old way. The new way would be these things, mobile, mobile devices. The business economy, uh, and uh, the network and, and how things work on the laptop business are completely different than the 
wireless business. These laptops used to, the focus used to be on the fast Intel chips, uh, the, the CPU. That was one of the things that was uh, used to sell them in the past. Um, uh, um, uh, that gave way to mobile devices focusing on limited battery use or limited battery use by the chip so that these lasted as long as possible. So the Intel chip in a laptop doesn't work in, an, uh, in a mobile device because the architecture is completely different. This thing is always plugged in for the most part. This is not plugged in. Uh, so there's some underlying technology changes between them. The business model of this is apps on top of it, you know, Microsoft Office, Adobe Creative Suite and other things. Uh, this is about an app culture, free downloads and the business models, advertising and in-app purchases. So when you go through shifts, everything changes. Um, you can see this, gosh, a hundred years ago, we were a horse driven economy. Uh, today we are a combustion engine driven economy. And if we gather together a room full of uh, horse executives in 1907 and ask them, what, what is the future? Uh, you ask a hay farmer, a, uh, um, a blacksmith, a veterinarian, uh, somebody who owned horse racetracks, somebody who made saddles, and you ask them what's the future, they would all have some kind of a rosy vision of the future. Oh, to, owning a horse is, is, is an asset. Horses pull plows, horses uh, bring goods to market. Horses allow you for personal transportation. They're incredibly flexible, they're great. What they didn't know is in 1908 that the uh, Model T was gonna be introduced. Model T was incredibly disruptive, not right away. It took 14 years to go from 8,000 cars to 2 million cars, but that was disruptive to the society and the horse economy. So horses didn't go away. We still have horses, uh, but, the, but the, the new driving economy went through the roof. The internal combustion engine went through the roof and the incumbents of the horse economy, they didn't sit back and just be disrupted. They had, to, they had their own stakeholders and families to feed. So the hay farmer and the blacksmith and the uh, racetrack owner, they all had to pivot, adapt, evolve, and become uh, entrepreneurs to, to deal with the new reality. So the hay farmer conveniently had an asset, land, so they could grow new things or they could use their land for a different purpose. The blacksmith was fashioning steel already in a U-shaped format. Now they, with the car, they can maybe fashion steel more intricately and, and more mass. Uh, so maybe they have to upskill. Uh, the race, uh, the, the horse track owner, they're a little separate. That's the world of luxury. Luxury is always a little, a little separate in the future because the nouveau riche like to do what the old, old guard did. So um, if you owned a old people uh, did equestrian and, and played polo, then the nouveau riche want to do the, the same thing. So um, um, that business tends to expand anywhere where you're dealing in luxury. The saddle maker has to pivot as well into, into um, car seats, for example. So the lesson here is when we go through a transition or a shift from the old way to the new way, we have to reinvent ourselves. And then we have to have that HR talk. So uh, fast forward to the modern time. At some point, Reed Hastings had to sit down with the head of the uh, red envelope business at Netflix and have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. And, and basically, it went something like this. Rushton, you're great. You're leading us forward in the red envelope business. Our, our company stock price has never been higher. But you've been in the meetings and you've seen where the winds are headed. It's, it's towards streaming. Streaming seems to be our future. And if we go to streaming, we also have to think about where our priorities are. Right now, we get all the money from the red envelope business, but our future is streaming. So we have to take the money from red envelopes, give it to the streaming team. And the impact of that is, over time, customer uh, interest is gonna shift as well. We're gonna need less warehouses. We're gonna need less staff. Um, your stature in the organization is gonna dwindle and, and devolve over time. So what do we need you to do but what do we need to do for you to get you to stick around for two years or more to make sure we're extracting as much value from the declining red envelope business so that we can pay up, pay and, and, and create this new stream business. Um, so as you, as you look at something like that, you know, we're talking about stages at which an organization or a company understands that they have plateaued or that they're about to get uh, leapfrogged or something along these lines. Uh, and, and I'm guessing that there are a number of ways that you approach getting people to think along the lines of pivoting involves a certain amount of creativity. 
-hmm. you mentioned Nintendo a little while back, right? And uh, and you also, in, in materials related to the Institute for the Future, talk about gaming technologies as a way of getting people to see possibilities they hadn't been before. Right. There's a mention of massively online uh, computer, you know, you know, these kinds of things. Uh, is, is that something that is still a part of how you work with your clients or is that, is that something from which you've pivoted? Um, uh, I, I, we, we definitely still do this. Uh, organizations have to come to an understanding that their world is about to change. So uh, the first thing is we want to help organizations identify the shifts that are coming to disrupt their world. Mm -hmm. So I'll use something that every, 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 probably every viewer of this is going to have an understanding of is the transportation industry, passenger vehicles. Um, most people on this, on this will uh, either own a call or have definitely experienced transportation in a, in a car. So the, the transportation industry is going through four simultaneous shifts uh, from owning cars to accessing cars. That's the Uber model. Mm -hmm. We're going from cars that are driven by combustion engine to cars that are driven by electric batteries. We're moving from cars that are manually driven to autonomous. And we're moving from, uh, so it's a business model shift, a technology shift, a technology shift. And a fourth one is an emotional shift. We're moving from a world where we're going from uh, uh, cars that connected us with society socially to smartphones that connect us with society socially. Um, and, and if you're in the car industry, most companies are rooted in the old way, um, selling cars to individuals that are combustion engine, that are manually driven, where people care about make and model. But the future is around vehicles that are accessed, that are uh, powered by battery, that are self-driving, where you just sit and, and noodle around on your smartphone. That's, that's the future. So if you're a company that's rooted in the past, you're not navigating one shift, you're navigating all four simultaneous, which is a very delicate balancing act. So how does that happen? So if you're a nouveau, if you're a new startup like Tesla, you don't start in the past, you start in the future. 100% electric battery. They're already ahead of the game. They, know, they have nothing holding them back in the combustion business space. Um, uh, so th that's the first reality is helping organizations understanding what are the big shifts that are impacting their world. Uh, a second component would be the data. Executives love data. We, we're all wonderful spreadsheet jockeys. We live and die by the data. It's the thing that helps us uh, inform our bosses about why we're doing something. The data tells us to do this. Look at the data. We, it projects into the future and it says we should expand or decline or move into this space, etc. Things are happening so fast nowadays that we can't track the data fast enough. And if you wait for the data to be collected, it's too late. So you need to be collecting something else and it's called a signal. A signal is a signpost of tomorrow, a, an example of a new, uh, a new reality that we're headed towards a shift. It could be a new business model, a new technology, a new law or regulation. It could be a, a change in social sentiment, but we, you need to track signals to suggest we're going in a certain direction just so that you're aware of, of where you're headed. Uh, and then, then the third thing is just an awareness of how one balances these two separate curves, the, the new rising uh, second curve versus the declining first curve. And there's things that you can see. Um, what is the legacy asset that we own? So for, for Netflix, it was the red envelope business. Just suck all the cash out of the red envelope business to move forward. For Google, it's advertising. For Facebook, it's advertising. Nobody wants to be advertised to. Right? We don't want more advertising in our lives. Uh, we, we're kind of at peak consumer advertising. We're not at peak advertising, but consumer appetite for advertising, we've plateaued. And Google is a poster child for this. They've reinvented themselves as Alphabet. Uh, they turned themselves into a corporate venture fund where they're taking everything from advertising and dumping it into all the new potential businesses because they realize the first curve decline is advertising and the next curve is self-driving cars, it's apps, it's cloud storage, it's handsets, it's, 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 a, it's a, a portfolio of, of new second curve offerings. So corporations need to prune what they're doing on the first curve in a mindful way as they grow their second curve opportunities. So we, we can help people under, uh, organizations understand that through uh, training and, and, and exposure to some of the techniques of thinking systematically about the future and shifts, signals, and 
the two curve framework that we, we use are really good techniques to help organizations see this, understand it, and, and start to think about what they can do um, moving forward. Okay. Um, and a, a final kind of, a final question before we, we wrap things up. As, as you talk about something like the changes in the auto industry, I think that that's kind of the perfect example because in addition to the, these multiple and profound changes that are part of, of the changing nature of that industry, you're also talking about different kinds of national strengths, right? And so, you know, one country that has this, this set of resources may lose out big with, with certain shifts that may happen. Uh, this has a lot of political implications, of course. Uh, it, it, there are all kinds of things that, that can go can go awry, as should we say, with regard to stability. With uh, with thinking along these these lines, uh, Andrew Yang, you know, kind of speaks about this kind of stuff, and in, in, you know his, uh, you know, in his speeches. Um, but I understand that you have a theme this year, which is the age of distributed superpowers, and and I and I'm guessing that 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 represents a legitimate segue. Uh, tell me if it doesn't, but. Uh, but tell me a little bit about that theme so we have a sense of, of where the, the Institute for the Future is currently focused. Um, yeah, I love that theme, but I, I, I actually prefer to talk about next year's theme, okay. uh, which is a little, a, a little different. And, and um, it's, it's about um, how organizations can build uh, a DNA to be long-term thinkers. The, the reality is most organizations are short-term thinkers. Um, you get in a situation where oh gosh, uh, money starts to get tight and what do we do? We cramp down on anything long-term and we just focus on the short-term and we throw all the, the long-term thinking out the door because we just want to survive over the next quarter or year. Um, that's the reality we live in. We live in a world of short-termism. And it's, 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 it's at the expense of our long-term viability. When, when, we, when we stop thinking long-term, we stop preparing for the long-term. And uh, this often happens when... Oh gosh, you have a new, so, so think a, a company has a strategy uh, uh, informed by the outside world and a new boss comes along. The new boss always comes on with new ideas, new people, and a new strategy. It's, it's completely confusing uh, to me because the strategy was probably in place. It just wasn't being executed uh, properly or there were some external factors that were were impacting it um, um, uh, not on the desired time frame of the of the organization we 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 live in a world where all we care about is growth and we can't even say the word decline we say negative growth instead of decline we, we can't come to terms with that mm -hmm. uh, so so as soon as negative stuff starts to happen we we, we go back to what we know works um, as opposed to keeping pace on what we should be doing. So our, 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 our theme next year is tr trying to help organizations balance the long-term focus with the, the, the tension of short-term thinking. So we're going to do a lot of research with organizations that are uh, doing best practices around that, that are um, identifying ways to do both at the same time. Um, and and, and it, it goes back to the balancing that pruning the first curve to, to uh, seeding, seeding the future for the second curve opportunities. Exciting stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap things up. And then at the very end, I'll hand it back to you for a final thought for all of those watching the recording. So for all of our, our members and our guests who've joined us for this, we thank you for taking your time to be part of the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley's weekly meeting. We hope that you will do two things. First, let us know you're here. There is a, there's a little thing down, uh, just a little bit farther down the page where you can put in your email address. You'll get a note that says you attended, which will be useful if you're trying to make up a missed attendance in your own club's meeting. Uh, and then a little farther down the page is our, is our discussion space where you can let us know what you thought of this program, what you thought of other elements of the meeting. You can respond to what other people have said. And that, that, uh, that discussion can be the kind of thing that, that is most vibrant in how we see our interaction as members of a service club. So we are excited that you're here. We hope you'll let us know that and leave a comment. To finish things up, I'd like to hand back to Sean for the final thought. Perfect. Uh, so I, I'd say the three tenets of a foresight professional uh, are, 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 are as follows. Number one, uh, foresight folks are asked to know a lot about a lot so that they can connect disparate ideas. What's going on in food over here could impact health. What's going on in tech could impact work. So we need to be good provocateurs to connect the dots, to explain what's going on. 
Second, we need to pull out insights from a team of people so that they can come up with new and different ideas. And the third thing we do is facilitate conversations around those ideas, collate them to identify a preferred future. And if you think about those three things, connecting disparate ideas, pulling these ideas um, into insights, and then uh, taking the insights and creating an action plan, those are also the three tenets of leadership. Leaders need to know foresight. Um, we're expecting them to know how things work, give us ideas, and, and lead us uh, forward. So if you start to dive deep into foresight, you're going to be a much more effective leader. Excellent. Thank you again. And everyone else, we'll see you next week. All right. Thanks, Rustin. Bye-bye, everybody.